morning, Abstract Algebra. Um, we have a bunch of things here that aren't quite working right uh, today, I'm trying to get everything set up uh, here from my home office one more time. So just give me another minute or two, uh, and we will get everything back to where it needs to be. There we go. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm coming to you from my home office today, uh, having left my webcam on you know, campus. Uh, of course, not knowing we were going to have a snow day, I expected I'd be there in person with you today. Um, but I suppose this is the next best thing. Uh, you get my Animoji, uh, at least for the course of the next hour long or so live stream that we're able to do together today. So um, what I wanna do is pick up where we left off uh, in our last session, um, where in the last live stream, we had an opportunity to look at a few problems um, that had to do with, first of all, how to uh, select and apply the various subgroup tests. Uh, so what can we do with the subgroup test to determine whether a given subset of the elements of a group actually form a subgroup? Um, and also, I want to push a little further um, along the problems that we didn't the, the topics that we didn't really get a chance to explore as much, which were the center and centralizer uh, of a group uh, or an element of a group. Uh, so we'll do a little bit more with those. Um, the goal, of course, being if you're in my class this semester, um, you know that we're going to have a quiz coming up at our next class meeting now on Wednesday. Uh, and then on Friday of this week, we'll have the first exam uh, for the semester. So we, I will be scheduling another live stream problem solving session for Thursday morning uh, to give us an opportunity to do some review problems together uh, and then we'll have the exam when we come together on Friday. So let's jump right back uh, into it by looking at the following problem. So the first thing I want to do is I want to talk again about order because order is such an important uh, concept in our course this semester. Um, it's one of the most powerful tools that we have now for differentiating between groups that are different. Um, and what I want to do is pick up the question uh, if I know the order of a pair of elements in a group, so if I know the order of A and I know the order of B, then is there a way, do I or can I, know the order of their product? A times B, where times, of course, means the operation in my group. Right? So this is really, the question can be stated as, um, how does order behave uh, under multiplication? How does the order of a product uh, relate to the orders of the factors in that product? And so there's some good news and there's also some bad news. Um, what I wanna do is, I suppose, do the usual thing and let's lead with the good news first, right? So the good news is this, is that if A and B happen to commute with one another, in other words, if AB is equal to BA, then this question uh, about uh, the commutativity, or about the rather about the order of elements in a group, uh, is one that we should be able to shed some some good light on. Um, I've got some issues here with my screen. Sorry, just give me a second here to repair. There we go. Um, so if A and B happen to commute, um, then we're going to be able to say something interesting. So at minimum, if A and B commute, then we'll at least be able to say the following, that the order of their product is going to be a factor Uh, of the product of the orders, order of A times the order of B. So this good news is something that let's posit, let's put this forward as a theorem. And I want to look at this theorem. I want to try to write a proof of this theorem uh, together because what it, one of the things that it does for us, it really lets us go deep with the concept of order uh, for a little while. Because order is so important to our understanding of group theory this semester, um, every chance we get, we should be practicing making arguments and writing proofs that have to do with the order of groups and the order of elements in groups. So I definitely want to look at that as a theorem. Um, so that's the good news. The bad news, is bad news that I want to frame in the following way. Um, let's take 
Let's take as an example uh, the following exercise uh, that comes out of our uh, online textbook. Let me quickly navigate to it uh, so that we can look at it together. So this exercise came out of the set of exercises that I'm recommending for Chapter 3. Um, and so you may already have had an opportunity to look at this problem, but maybe not because it's pretty far down my list <laughs> of numbers of problems to look at. Um, but let me pull it up on the screen here real quick. Uh, so this is, again, the preparation problems for Chapter 3. Um, let me sneak this up a little bit. There we go. It's in the preparation problems for Chapter 3, and it's question number 9. And so in question number 9, uh, we're talking about the group R star. So this is the group of real numbers, the non-zero real numbers, with the operation of multiplication. Um, and the question is asking us to find an example of an element A and an element B real numbers that are non-zero, such that a and b both have infinite order, but their product, a times b, does not have an infinite order. Okay. So bad news is that it's possible, for example, for two infinite order elements to have a finite order product. And so when infinity is at the table, as it very often does, it can spoil a lot of our other uh, reasoning uh, that we might think is perfectly reasonable otherwise. So let's actually start by thinking about this question. Um, how is it possible uh, for two uh, non-zero real numbers to individually have infinite order, but their product has a finite order, has order two? If you look at the hint that I provide you, in here. Um, that's the hint that I'm, of course, going to follow, because it's my hint after all. To start with the last criterion and answer the question, what elements in R star actually have order 2? So what are the order 2 elements in the multiplicative group of non-zero real numbers? Um, since this is my home office, I have to go quickly open my office door to let my cat out of it. Um, let me do that real quick while you're thinking about this question, and I'll be back in about 10 seconds. All right, sorry about that. So um, let's answer that second question first, right? Answer the hint first. What elements in R star have order two? So let's think about what that would look like. Um, if the order of x is equal to two, what does that mean? Um, that would mean, again, we're talking about R star here. Uh, that would mean that x times x, again, multiplication is the operation here, x times x is the identity element of r star. And the identity element of r star is the real number 1. Right? Multiplication is my operation, and so the identity is the multiplicative identity. Um, and so, in other words, we would be looking for a non-zero real number that has the property that x squared is equal to 1. Um, but there are two such numbers. Right? There are two non-zero real numbers whose square is equal to 1. There's positive 1 and there's negative 1. But if we're claiming that the order of x is equal to 2, that means that the second power of x has to be equal to 1, but the first power of x cannot be equal to the identity. The first power of x cannot equal 1. Um, and so x squared equals 1, but x is not equal to 1. And therefore, we know for sure that the only, in fact, uh, element of r star that has order 2 is the real number negative 1. So that helps to kind of frame uh, the work in this problem a little bit to say that what we're really looking for is we're looking for a pair of numbers a and b uh, which again are non-zero real numbers and I want them to have the property that when I multiply them together a times b is going to be an element of r star that has order 2. In other words, a times b is going to be negative 1. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. I want uh, a real number a and a real number b whose product is equal to minus 1. Another way, in other words, uh, they are opposite reciprocals of one another. If they were the slopes of two lines in the xy plane, those lines would be perpendicular. Um, that's just a little freebie for you. 
So pretty much any pair of numbers that I can write down, if I select them at random from the real number line, um, if one of them is the opposite reciprocal of the other, they're going to fit the bill here. So as an example, let's suppose I choose A to be 2. And therefore, I would have to choose B to be negative 1 half. If I made that selection, then that selection would have the property that A times B is equal to negative 1, as desired. But, uh, and therefore, the order of AB is equal to 2. Don't get the order symbol, by the way, confused with the absolute value symbol. Um, that's really only a danger when the objects in our groups are actually, you know, subsets of the real numbers like they are here. Um, anytime, you, anytime you see vertical bars, unless I say otherwise this semester, they will refer to the order of elements rather than to absolute values or um, other familiar constructs from when you used vertical bars before. Um, but what is the order of the element A? And what is the order of the element B? In other words, the order of the element 2 and the order of the element negative a half. Well, what happens when we combine 2, let's say, with itself repeatedly using the operation of our star? What's going to happen? Well, 2 combined with itself just the one time gives me 2 itself. When I combine it with itself using multiplication again, I get 4. Again, I get 8. Again, I get 16. Again, I get 32, and so forth. But notably, what never happens is that I never get back around to the multiplicative identity, the identity element of R star. I cannot multiply 2 by itself any number, any positive number of times and make that result equal to 1 in R star. That's never going to happen. The only, the only way, in other words, to solve the equation 2 to the x power is equal to 1 is to set x equal to 0. Uh, that's the only way to do it. So the order of 2 is infinite. And for the same reason, the order of negative half is also infinite. Because if I multiply negative a half by itself once, I get um, the, the second power is positive a quarter. And then the third power is negative 1 eighth. The fourth power is one, it's, uh, positive 1 16th. The fifth power is negative 1 over 32. But that's never again going to come back around to equal 1. And so 2 and negative 1 half are each elements of infinite order in R star. <clears throat> but when I take their product, excuse me, their product negative 1 has order 2 in R star. So this is just one example, um, but coming using this kind of framework, you can probably come up with any number of other examples uh, that also fit this bill. So that's kind of the bad news. Um, and it would seem that maybe this bad news is limited uh, to the case where um, where some of my elements have infinite order. Because uh, as soon as infinity is in the mix, uh, we can get weird things happening that kind of you know might fly in the face of our, our reasoning over here. Um, unfortunately, though, the bad news doesn't quite end there. Um, let's suppose uh, for the moment that we... Well, because... Um, and let me back up a step. Um, this example, R star, R star is an abelian group. Um, because after all, multiplication of real numbers is commutative. It satisfies the commutative property. And for that reason, uh, this commutativity that's a part of our theorem over here uh, is actually in place. And the only reason that this result doesn't appear to hold is that the order of A and the order of B were each infinity. right? Uh, and so this, uh, this theorem over here would seem to have not held water because of the infinite order uh, phenomena. So what if we have a finite group, or at least finite order elements in a group, uh, what can we say um, can we say that the order of AB uh, is a factor of the product of the orders of elements A and B uh, when all of them are finite? when all of these orders are finite. So let's see if maybe we can come up with uh, uh, another example of something where this might happen. Well, um, let's think about some, let's think about some examples that we, uh, that we are familiar with. Uh, so, so far, our prototype for a group that's not abelian is the group of symmetries of a regular polygon. 
So if my group is, for example, the group of symmetries of the octagon, D8, uh, this is a group that has 16 elements in it, 2 times 8, 16. So what can we say uh, then about uh, whether or not this kind of result here can hold? Well, um, let's take as one of my elements the, uh, the reflection T. And then let's take as another one of my elements the element TR. Uh, sorry, let's do TR to the... Uh, I'm going to play around with this a little bit. Let's do TR and then let's also do TR cubed or something. Right? So here are two elements in my dihedral group for the octagon. Um, just for fun, uh, let's fire up our app just to convince ourselves that indeed these, uh, these elements are just reflections of the octagon. So if I bring up my dihedral group explorer, which you can find at bit.ly slash dihedral scratch, bring up my octagon. Um, so now if I do TR, that's a reflection across this vertical line followed by a rotation. What it looks like, uh, if I take a, if I kind of squint at what I have here, I notice that the vertex one and the vertex five have remained in place. So TR actually is nothing more than a reflection of the octagon across the axis of symmetry that passes through the vertices 1 and 5. It's nothing more than just that reflection. That's what I get when I do TR. So what we're looking at here is the symmetry which corresponds to the element A. What about B? TR cubed. T -R -R -R. If I squint at this, what I find out is that the vertices 8 and 4 have remained in place under this symmetry. And all we've done here is we've effected a reflection across the axis of symmetry of this octagon that runs through the vertices 8 and 4. So both A and B are just reflections. And because they're reflections, if I do either one of those uh, operations twice, so if I do TR cubed once, and then I do it one more time, T, R, 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 I find out that what I get is I get back to the original position of my octagon. In other words, b squared, or tr cubed squared, gives me the identity. And for that reason, b is an element of order 2. I can make that same argument about a. a squared is equal to the identity, but a is not itself the identity, so a is an element of order 2. So that's what I know about the elements a and b uh, themselves. What now can I say about their product? make some space here. AB. Well, that's TR multiplied by TR to the third power. And I want to simplify that product using the simplification rules of the dihedral group of the octagon. And remember, the simplification rules for the dihedral group of any uh, regular n-gon is that RT is equal to TR inverse. This is the one uh, one of the simplification rules. Uh, it's one of the relations, we would say, in the dihedral group. The others are that t squared is the identity and that r to the nth power is the identity. So there's my set of simplification facts that I can use uh, to simplify an expression in any of my dihedral groups. So I can use that to simplify this rt that I see here in the middle of my expression. This rt becomes t r inverse. And then I still have a t on the left. I have an r to the third power on the right. And now I can use my second set of uh, simplification rules to simplify t squared into the identity. And therefore, we can just cancel that t squared, if you like it. We don't need to write it. Um, and then I have r to the inverse, r to the minus 1 times r to the 3. So I get r to the 2. So, so far, um, what I'm seeing here is uh, that a times b gives me r squared. Well, let's ask the question, what's the order of that element? What's the order of a, b? How many times do I have to apply r squared before I get back to the identity? Well, in the dihedral group of the octagon, I can apply it once. So there's one operation of r squared. If I do it twice, my octagon ends up here. Three times, it ends up there. Four times it ends up back at the identity. So it takes me four applications of r squared before I get back around to my identity. And so the order of a times b is equal to four. 
And when I look at the orders of A and B themselves, they were each elements of order two. And so our temptation, our temptation here is that here, the order of AB, that was equal to four. The order of A was equal to two. The order of B was equal to two. And once again, crowding out my window here, let me scoot it over. The temptation is just to conclude that the product of the orders is always the order of the product. Well, of course, if I'm calling it a temptation instead of a theorem, that probably means I have a counterexample up my sleeve. Uh, and indeed it does. Uh, so let's bring that counterexample out. Um, so I just so happen to choose these two specific rotations, TR's reflections rather, TR and TR cubed. Um, but what if instead of TR and TR cubed, I had reached for TR and TR squared instead? So let me change the game on you a little bit. Um, each of those is a rotation, sorry, a reflection. I keep using the wrong R word. Um, but now, if I were to do this simplification of A times B, TR times TR squared, now TR times TR squared is not going to be the second power of R. It's going to be the first power of R. Right? And therefore, the first power of R just the single rotation by 45 degrees. If you visualize it here on the screen, it's just that rotation right there. That's the, whoops, let me reset and then do the R. This is what R looks like. It's a symmetry of my regular octagon. What is the order of that operation? Well, that element's first power is not the identity. Its second power is not. Its third power is not. Its fourth power is not. Neither is its fifth, sixth, or seventh. It takes me eight applications of that 45 degree rotation to get me back to the identity. And so in this example, the order of AB is equal to eight. And now, if we look back at this temptation, right, now I have two reflections of my octagon, therefore they have order two, each of them individually, right? But there, and so the right-hand side of this equation is still a two and a two, but now the left-hand side of my equation, the order of their product is actually eight. So not only does this provide us with a counterexample for our temptation theorem, right, that the order of a product is the product of the orders. But it also puts the lie to the possible truth of this theorem, the theorem that says that two elements that, uh, uh, that at least two elements that commute have the property that the uh, pr order of the product is a factor of the product of the orders. That's not even true. The conclusion of this theorem is not even close to true uh, for this example. Um, and you might expect that the reason is that this A and this B, these reflections, don't commute one with another. And you'd be right um, if we take the opportunity real quickly to work out what is BA. Let's just do that arithmetic real quick. TR squared times TR. Or another way to write that is TRR, TR. And now I'm again going to use my simplification rule for the dihedral group to say that I can leapfrog a T from the right side of an R to the left side of an R at the cost of transforming that R into its inverse. And I'll use that to take this T, jump it to the left once over this R, twice over that R, and therefore we'll turn each of those R's into their inverses. And so I'll have that T arriving on the left side of the R's, turning each of them into an R inverse. And now again, using my simplification rules, my pair of T's, are gonna give me the identity. I have an R inverse R sitting here that's also gonna give me the identity. Um, and so the only thing that's gonna be left over here is R inverse, which is another name in the dihedral group for the octagon of R to the seventh. So in fact, this A and this B do not commute one with another. AB is equal to the 45 degree counterclockwise rotation. BA is equal to the 45 degree clockwise rotation for this octagon. Uh, so because A and B don't commute in this example, they are immune to the conclusion of the theorem that we're gonna to try to prove over here. Right? Um, so I guess my moral of the story up until this point in our lesson is to avoid the temptation of thinking that the product of two elements will have its order equal to the product of the orders of the original pair of elements because that just ain't so in general. Um, and even when A and B do commute, uh, notice what this theorem is saying. It's not saying that the order of the product is equal to the product of the orders. It's saying that the order of the product is a factor of the product of the orders. Um, so definitely be super duper careful um, 
in trying to figure out what the order of an element is. Even knowing that that element is a product of other elements, we really do need to know more about the story before we can say for sure what the order of a product of two elements is going to be. Fortunately for us, as we go forward through the next couple of chapters, uh, we're going to develop some understanding of some different uh, sort of exemplar groups, groups that we are going to want to study a lot because we can learn a lot about abstract algebra in the concrete settings of those groups. Um, and one of the things that we're always going to try to do uh, is try to develop some rules for order um, in, the, in the groups that we study. And so in some cases, we will be able to know with some certainty how the order of a product relates to the product of the orders. But I'm hoping that this first uh, cautionary tale shows us that we can't jump to conclusions uh, in general if we don't know what kind of group that we're working with. Let's try and develop a proof uh, for this theorem uh, that I have up here on the screen because this will give us a chance um, both to think about order yet again um, but also uh, to write another proof because we can never have too much practice uh, writing proofs together. So let's bring out our, our cocktail napkin uh, and see if we can uh, work together uh, where, sort of how, to, how to develop some intuition for this proof and then we'll try to write it up uh, as well. Scroll down here to the bottom, let me add in a page break, uh, and let me just type in the proposition. Uh, I guess we're calling it a theorem, why not? Let G be a group, and A and B be elements of my group. If AB is equal to BA, then the order of their product is a factor of the product of their orders, i.e., the order of AB is a factor of the order of A times the order of B. All right, let me get that onto our screen here. All right, so there is the thing that we are going to try and prove. So we'll do that by first going over to our cocktail napkin, and we'll see if we can uh, sort of noodle out the the, the key observation, the key insight uh, from the algebra that's going to let us do this. So let's say on my napkin, I've got an element A, I've got an element B. Let me give them, let me give their orders names. Let's call the order of A N, and we'll call the order of B M. I suppose in order to make this theorem work, we probably needed um, A and B uh, to have finite order so that n and m are actually numbers, uh, and this observation here, the, 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 the product is a factor of the products of the orders, that makes any sense at all. After all, if a and b have infinite order, then we can get silly stuff like happened with our uh, r star example at the beginning of our lesson today. All right, so that means that I can call the order of a a real number n, or sorry, a, a positive integer n, the order of b a positive integer m. And so what this tells me is that the nth power of a is equal to the identity element in my group, and the mth power of b is equal to the identity element in my group. Right, so those are the two things that I know based on the assumption that the order of a is equal to n and the order of b is equal to m. And so here's what I want to do. What is the order of the product a, b going to be? So it seems reasonable that what I would want to do here is I would want to take this product, the order of A times the order of B, um, that is going to be in my notation now, N times M. And so if I want to make the argument that the product AB has an order which is a factor of N times M, what I want to try on my napkin is I just want to try raising AB to that power, to the N times M power. So let's just do it. Right. A, B to the N times M power. Well, so what is this going to equal? This is going to equal A, B multiplied by A, B, multiplied by A, B, multiplied by A, B, a total of N times M times. And we're right to be a little bit suspicious that we're not going to know how to evaluate that product in a general group. But we've made an assumption uh, about our elements A and B. Namely, we've assumed that A and B commute one with another. And because they commute one with another, 
that means that I can take any of the B's that I want to and shove them to the right past the A's and shove all the A's to the left in my expression. Because A and B commute with one another, it doesn't matter which order we write the A's and the B's in this expression. And so because of my assumption, so I'm going to write that here, because A and B commute, it turns out that I can push all the A's to the front, all N times M of them, I can push all the b's to the back, all n times m of them. In other words, because a and b commute with one another, we can actually distribute this exponent across the operation inside those parentheses, which is something, remember, we can't do in general in a group. But we can certainly do in any abelian group but we've actually made a weaker assumption here. We, we don't know that G is an abelian group, but we happen to know that A and B inside of this group commute with one another. Right? We don't need the entire group to be abelian in order to make this conclusion. We just need A and B to be abelian with each other. It's kind of a, a way to, to think about it. A and B are, are commutative with one another, even if they might not commute with anything else uh, inside the group. They at least commute with each other, and that's enough to be able to draw the conclusion. All right, so now where do we go from here? Now we've got our powers on A and B, respectively. Well, what do we know about A? We know that the nth power of A is equal to the identity. And here, we're seeing the nth power of A as a factor in this expression. After all, just by general properties of exponents, the n times mth power of A is the mth power of the nth power of A. But the nth power of A is the identity again, by our assumption that n is the order of the element a. For the same reason, we can also write b to the n times m as, according to the commutative property of multiplication of integers, b to the m times n, and then using general properties of exponents, we can also make that a power of a power, the nth power of the mth power of b, and by our assumption that m is the order of the element b, that means that that power of b is also equal to the identity. And then by the identity property, the mth power of the identity times the nth power of the identity is just going to equal the identity. And so what we found out here is that when I raise the power, uh, sorry, when I raise the product ab to the n times mth power, I get the identity. ab to the power nm is equal to the identity. Now, one of the most important things to remember about order, and this is a string that we're going to pull on a lot more in chapter four as well, because order is going to become our living, breathing uh, existence when we get past the midterm uh, and we go into chapter four. But one of the most important things to remember is what this equation is not telling me. This equation does not tell me that the order of AB is equal to n times m. What it does tell me is that the order of AB will divide n times m. That's the order of AB. Because this is not telling me that there might not be a smaller exponent than nm, which also makes AB to that exponent equal to the identity. But it does tell me uh, that the order divides n times m. And that's exactly what we're trying to prove here, right? That the order is a factor of n times m. And so this is the point on my napkin when I kind of say, OK, that's, that's exactly the insight that we wanted. Right? That's what we needed to have uh, in order to do this proof. So let's take this from our cocktail napkin uh, onto the page and try and get this written up. So first thing I'm going to do uh, is try and signal to my, my reader um, that uh, we need to bring an A and a B onto the table uh, in this example. And we need to, uh, using a direct proof, right, we're going to make the assumption that AB is equal to BA. So we'll do that by bringing a, b into existence using a let statement. So let a and b be elements of my group, um, be commuting elements, i.e. Uh, a, b is equal to b, a. So that, again, brings my a and my b into existence in my proof, so there's no surprise symbols. And it also signals to the reader that we're going to be doing a direct proof. So let's reinforce that by writing down the burden of proof we wish to show that the order of AB divides the order of A times the order of B. 
But let's also take this opportunity to introduce our readers uh, to the shorthand notation uh, of n and m, n being the order of the element a, m being the order of the element b. Uh, so let's actually edit this for a minute. We'll come back here and say, we'll define, uh, or let n equal the order of a and m equal the order of b, be the orders of the elements a and b in g. And now we can use our shorthand to say we wish to show that the order of a, b divides n, m. Right? So now my burden of proof is I want to show that the order of a, b divides the product n times m. But, and I'm looking at the end of my napkin here, um, we're going to get there. We want to shift our burden of proof to actually be this equation. Right? We want to show that the n mth power of a, b is equal to the identity. So here, we'll, we'll shift that burden of proof and remind the reader that that's what we're doing. It will suffice to show that uh, the a, b to the power n, m is equal to the identity. So we've, we've defined a burden of proof, and then we've immediately shifted the burden of proof to tell the reader that what we're really going to do to establish the truth of our argument is just to show that the n mth power of a, b is equal to the identity. And now we'll actually do the, the algebraic argument uh, that was done here uh, on the napkin. We'll put that piece of the argument uh, into our proof. So a, b to the, pro, to the power n, m is going to be equal to uh, oh, having some issues with our server here for a second. Let's bring it back online and hope that we didn't lose any of our work. <laughs> this is the other danger of, uh, of doing a live stream. Looks like it's coming back. I just had a small hiccup over at Overleaf. Every once in a while. Uh, their servers have an issue. All right, let's see if we're back up here. Yeah, we're good. Okay, so AB to the power NM uh, is going to be equal to um, A to the power NM times B to the power NM. And the byline for that, remember, so in order to distribute this exponent, uh, we needed to know that A and B commute. So we'll remind the reader um, by assumption that a and b commute. Right? That is a, a fundamental to our argument here. We wouldn't be able to distribute that uh, exponent otherwise. But then is when the magic happens, right? Because we can make this the nth power of a raised to the nth power, followed by the mth power of b raised to the nth power. And all we used there were properties of exponents. So I'll add that byline in there as well. Um, just to remind ourselves that this is just the power of a power property that exists for all uh, positive, all integer exponents. But then is when we reminded ourselves what we knew about the nth power of a and the nth power of b, because n and m respectively are the orders of the elements a and b. That means that this is the mth power of the identity multiplied by the nth power of the identity um, by assumption that the order of a is equal to m and uh, n rather, and the order of b is equal to m. Oops, dropped a, a curly brace there. There we go. So using our assumption about the orders of these elements. And then this is equal to the identity, just by the identity property. Right? If I multiply the identity by anything, it's going to leave it unchanged. So if I multiply a whole bunch of identity elements by each other, they're going to all leave each other unchanged and give me the identity. And thus, we've met our burden of proof. The burden of proof was that we needed to show that the n mth power of AB is equal to the identity. We've just done that. Therefore, the order of the product AB uh, divides um, the product nm as desired. And I'll put in a square to end my proof. So there is a proof, right? It, it tells us that. We don't know for sure what the order of a product of elements is going to be, even if we know the product of the original elements. But if those elements commute, we'll at least be able to say that the order of the product divides the product of the orders. Um, in more concrete settings where we know exactly what our group is, again, we're going to develop some more understanding of specific cases. 
of how order behaves in a product. Um, but in general, um, this is as much as we're going to be able to say for now. I'm going to pause here for about 15 or 20 seconds. If you're watching live and you have questions that you want to contribute either into Slack or into our Twitch chat, uh, please do so. Uh, we're going to come back uh, after this and talk about a couple more examples. First of all, of using a subgroup test. Uh, and then second of all, uh, we're going to look at a proof that uses the definition of centralizer. So we'll come back in about uh, 20 seconds, and we'll do that then. All right, so let's look at the second topic on the agenda down here for today, uh, which is uh, which is going to ask us to establish the following question. So let's suppose that I have a group. Uh, let's make this a proposition here. So let's suppose that you give me a group, any group at all. And you also give me a subset of elements. So we'll call it H. H is the subset of all elements in my group, such that the order of that element is equal to either 1 or 2. So it's all the elements of order 1 and all the elements of order 2 piled in together uh, with one another into a subset. And what I want to do is prove that H is a subgroup of G. So remember, if you just give me a subset of the elements of a group, um, we can't know for sure that that subset of elements taken together with itself will make a self-consistent algebraic system, will make a group in and of itself. Right? When it does, when a subset of elements behaves like a group with the inherited uh, operation from the bigger group, then we call that subset a subgroup. And so that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to show that if I take all the elements of orders one or two in my group, um, then I'm going to get uh, a subgroup of that group. As an example, let's go back to the dihedral group of the octagon uh, again. What are the elements? There are the identity, r, r squared, r to the third, r to the fourth, r to the fifth, r to the sixth, r to the seventh, and then t, and tr, and tr squared, oh boy, tr to the third, tr to the fourth, tr to the fifth, tr to the sixth. And now I'm realizing that this thing that I've put forward here as a proposition, um, maybe we shouldn't be so confident about it yet. Let's call it a conjecture. Because just in writing down this example, uh, I'm already doubting myself whether or not this is a true statement. Um, but let's think about uh, what subset H would be in this example. I would need to take all of my elements of order 1. Well, there's only one element of order 1 in any group. That's the identity element, and the identity element is unique. Then I need to go searching for all of my elements of order 2. Well, every one of my reflections in the dihedral group is going to be an element of order two. So I'm going to have all of my reflections, all eight of them um, taken together, are going to be a part of this. And there's also a rotation that has order two, the 180 degree rotation. And so my subset here would consist of the identity element, the 180 degree rotation, and then all of my reflections, tr, tr squared, tr to the third, tr to the fourth, tr to the fifth, tr to the sixth, tr to the seventh. So this is my subset. And we could really quickly, why don't we do this, let's just count and figure out what is the cardinality of this subset. I'm carefully using the word cardinality instead of order. Um, that's because we don't know that this is a group. We do know that it's a set, though. Uh, and if I count up how many elements are here, uh, it turns out that there's 10. Right. There's eight of these rotations, reflections rather, plus the 180 degree rotation, plus the identity. So there are 10 elements in my subset. And my original group, um, D8, 
has 16 elements in it, right? It has order 16. Okay, so is this H in fact a subgroup of G? Well, does it meet the criteria? Is, would the operation in D8 be associative on this set of elements? Of course it would. Associativity is not a problem. Let's go through and, and convince ourselves. Right. Associative, yes. No problem. Remember, that's a criterion that we never need to check explicitly uh, when, my, uh, when my subset came from a group to begin with, because the operation on the big group is associative. The operation on a subset of that big group will still be associative, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, what about the identity property? Identity property is fine. Right? Uh, because we have the identity from my bigger group present in my subset. So no problem with identity. There's no identity crisis. Uh, inverse. What about the inverse property? Well, the inverse of the identity is the identity. Uh, the inverse of the 180 degree rotation is itself. The inverse of each of my reflections is itself. Um, remember, all of these elements that I wrote here in purple have order two. And when I'm an element of order two, that means that I am my own inverse. And so the inverse property is not a problem either. Right? The inverse property is a go. Because all of these elements are their own inverses, we know for sure that their inverses will belong to the group because they belong to the, the subset, rather. Well, because they belong to the subset. So associativity is fine. Identity is fine. Inverses are fine. So then the last question is about closure. Does this subset have the closure property? Well, if I combine r to the fourth with self, I get the identity. If I combine any of these elements with themselves, I get the identity. So if I'm going to come up with a reason to disbelieve the closure property, it will be because I can combine two different elements uh, with one another uh, and get something which is outside of my subset. Let's try it. Um, what if, for example, I combine t with tr to the second power, or something like that. Each of those reflections, t and tr squared, is a part of my subset. But when I combine them together with the operation in my group d8, right, the usual simplification rules for the dihedral group apply. And therefore, t multiplied by t is going to give me the identity. And so when I multiply this out, I get i r squared, which is just equal to r squared. But what's the problem with that? The problem is r squared is not one of the elements in my subset. And so we have a problem. The closure property has been violated. And therefore, my conjecture is definitely not true. Right? My conjecture was um, that the set of elements, all of whose uh, order is either 1 or 2, um, is not necessarily going to be a subgroup of G, because here is a counterexample uh, in which that doesn't happen. So maybe we can back up a step. Anytime we have a conjecture and we, we observe that it's not a true conjecture, um, there are two reasons for a conjecture to be false. Um, one of them is that the hypotheses were not strong enough. Maybe there is an assumption that we needed about my group that we didn't include. Um, the other possibility is that the conclusion is too strong. Maybe the conclusion is overstating the case. Um, so maybe instead of being a subgroup of G, maybe it's something weaker. Um, but there's not much that we know about right now that's weaker than a subgroup and stronger than a subset. Uh, so chances are, if we're going to patch up this conjecture, what we need to do is make a stronger assumption in the hypothesis. Maybe there's something we need to know about G. What if we added in an assumption? This is our conjecture, so we can do that. Right? Turned out our conjecture wasn't true. But maybe if we add a stronger assumption, maybe we assume that my group is abelian. Now let's see if we can come up with a reason to, to believe this conjecture. Um, remember, associativity, identity, and inverses, those were satisfied even in this example. Um, it was closure where we ran into a problem. And we can talk ourselves through um, identity and inverse will be true always, right? Because identity is an element of order one, so it's definitely going to belong to my subset. The inverse property will also hold because all my elements of order two are their own inverses, and therefore their inverses will belong to the set because they belong to the set. 
So it's really just closure that's the problem. Um, and the reason is, here I had two elements whose order was two, but their product was not of order one or two. Right? Their product had order four, which is why it didn't belong to this subset. So if we're going to patch this up, it's probably going to have something to do with my elements commuting with one another. So let's try it. Um, let's try looking just again at another example. Anytime we have a conjecture, we're not sure whether it's true. Um, the best approach is to just try some examples where we can wrap our hands uh, around uh, the understanding that we're looking for in a concrete setting. Uh, and then maybe that example will suggest whether or not we can believe this conclusion. So now let's think of an abelian group. Let's let g be the additive group of integers mod, uh, I don't know, mod 20. So this is going to be all of my residue classes mod 20, 0 up to 19, arranged around the face of a clock, uh, with addition mod 20. And so you'll ask, what are my elements of order 1? What are my elements of order 2? Well, there's only one element of order 1 in any group. It's the identity element, which is unique. And the identity element in this group is 0. So that's my element of order 1. What's an element of order 2 in this group? Well, an element of order 2, x and z20 uh, has order 2, uh, means that x added to itself is going to be equal to the identity element mod 20. In other words, 2 times x is going to be congruent to 0 mod 20. So 2x is going to be a multiple of 20. And the only x that satisfies that is the residue class of 10 mod 20. So 0 has order 1. 10 has order 2. So here's my subset h. Now, does this subset H qualify as a subgroup of G? Associativity, identity, inverses, those are all true. What about closure? 0 plus 0 is 0. 10 plus 10 is 0. 0 plus 10 is 10. 10 plus 0 is 10. So in this example, closure is indeed satisfied, and H is a subgroup of G. So at least in this example, we have some reason to believe that maybe this is a true statement. Um, let's uh, take a quick, uh, let's think about whether or not we can expect this thing to be true uh, in more generality. So if I want to show that this thing is true in general, uh, what I probably want to do uh, is I probably want to apply a subgroup test uh, of some kind. Um, so let's let's chase that idea for a minute, just you know, in our scratch work here on a napkin. Let's see if we can convince ourselves um, that this closure property is satisfied. So this would be to say that uh, if A and B uh, belong to my subset, then AB belongs to my subset. Right? That would be the statement of the closure property. So is this thing true? Um, so let's suppose that A belongs to my subset and B belongs to my subset. Now, if either A or B uh, has order 1, that means that that A or that B is going to be the identity element. Um, and we know for sure that when I multiply the identity element by something, it's not going to change that thing. Uh, and so, of course, if either A or B is the identity, then AB is going to belong to H. Um, so the only interesting case uh, is when A and B each are elements of order 2. Order 2, order 2. Right. This would mean that A squared is equal to the identity, and B squared is equal to the identity. So what can I say about AB? Does AB belong to H? Well, it will belong to H exactly if the order of AB is either 1 or 2. To figure that out, let's take AB and raise it to its second power. What am I going to get? Well, because my group is abelian, I can distribute this 2 uh, across this product uh, because A and B commute by assumption because my group is abelian. My whole group is abelian now. So this is going to be a squared times b squared. 
but because of my assumptions about a and b, this is equal to the identity times the identity, and that's equal to the identity. So a b squared is equal to the identity, and what that means then is that the order of a b is a divisor, is a factor of 2. But the only factors of 2 are 1 and 2. And therefore, a b has order 1 or order 2. Therefore, a b belongs to h. So it does look like this closure principle is going to be true. We've just proven that it's going to be true. Um, so what that's going to permit me to do uh, is to transform this into a proof of this conjecture. So now this conjecture becomes a theorem. Uh, we'll write a proof of it, um, and we'll use a subgroup test as a part of that proof. So let's write that proof uh, together. So we can elevate our conjecture into a theorem. So let's let G be an abelian group and H be the subset of elements of G, which have the property that the order of X is equal to 1 or possibly 2. Then H is a subgroup of G. All right, so there's a statement of the thing that I would like to prove. Let's get that up onto the screen here. Then H is a subgroup of G. Let's write our proof using the work that we have over on the napkin off to the side. So what subgroup test have we set ourselves up to use here? So we were able to verify the closure property directly. Uh, we are also able to convince ourselves that the inverse is property held. Those are exactly the two steps that make up the two-step subgroup test. So we'll signify to our reader that that's the strategy that we're going to use. We'll use the two-step subgroup test. And in saying so, that signals our strategy. Now let's spell out, remind the reader what the two-step subgroup test actually accomplishes um, to tell them then what the burden of proof is. We'll use the two-step subgroup test. We must show that um, we must show that the subset H is closed under inverses and also closed under uh, the operation of the group. So rather than saying something like given elements A and B, we need to do our let statement. So let's let A and B um, come into existence here. Let A and B um, be elements of H, arbitrarily chosen. Uh, we wish to show that AB belongs to H and that A inverse belongs to H. That is exactly the content of the two-step subgroup test. Two-step subgroup test says that if I establish uh, these are true for all A and B chosen arbitrarily from my subset, then the two-step subgroup test shows that H is a subgroup of G. So now we've stated our burden of proof. Our burden of proof has these two different statements in it. So let's, um, again, do the reader a favor by breaking those two things out. So to give ourselves some milestones. There we go. All right, so here are the two things that I want to prove. All right, so to prove that AB belongs to H, um, it will suffice to show that AB squared is equal to the identity. Since then, uh, we will know that the order of AB will be a factor of 2, i.e. will be either 1 or 2. So here I'm stating my burden of proof for that first piece of the claim, that AB is an element of H. It will suffice to show that AB squared is equal to the identity. And so now we'll go to the work that we did on the napkin to show that AB quantity squared is equal to the identity. AB quantity squared is equal to A squared B squared. And the reason for that, once again, is that A and B commute by assumption. By assumption that G is abelian, we know that A and B commute. So there's my byline for that, uh, that key observation here. But then A squared is equal to the identity. B squared is equal to the identity. So E times E. By assumption that A and B belong to H. After all, if A and B are elements of this subset, then that means either the order of A is 1 or 2, either the order of B is 1 or 2, 
and therefore when I raise either of those elements to the second power, I'm going to get the identity. But then by the identity property, this is equal to the identity element of my group. And therefore we've met our burden of proof. Thus, AB belongs to H. By the way, here's a freebie as well. Um, we tend to end our proofs uh, with a little uh, with a little square to stand in for the end of proof symbol, the quad arot demonstrandum. Sometimes it's called a tombstone. I don't know why. It's a little bit morbid uh, at the end of a proof, but it sort of shows that our work is done. Um, when we reach a, an intermediate step, when we've proved a lemma or a, or a subclaim or a step, sometimes I'll use a little diamond there instead of a square, just to kind of indicate we've established one of the claims. Now we're going to move on to the other one. So how do we know that A inverse belongs to H? Well, um, if the order of A is equal to 1, then A is equal to the identity element, and A inverse is therefore equal to the identity element, right? uh, which will belong to H. And already I'm thinking that this is probably an inefficient way uh, to, to do this proof. Rather, um, let's shift our burden of proof. It will suffice to observe that every element of H is in fact its own inverse. Now why is every element of H its own inverse? Well, this is true um, because if the uh, order of A is equal to 1, then A is equal to the identity element and that's equal to the inverse of the identity element. We know for sure the identity element is its own inverse. If the order of A is equal to 2, then A squared is equal to the identity, and hence A inverse is going to be equal to A. Right? And hence, uh, in either of these situations, in either case, uh, A inverse belongs to H, because A belonged to H in the first place. And that completes my proof. Thus, by the two-step subgroup test, H is a subgroup of G, and we're done. Cool. So there is a proof uh, of the assertion that if you give me an abelian group, the subset of elements in that group whose orders are one or two, that subset actually forms a subgroup of my group itself. We also saw by a counterexample that if we relax that abelian group assumption, that this result is not in general going to be true. That was our dihedral group example. So this was a good uh, excuse uh, for us once again to apply a subgroup test um, and also to uh, just get some more practice with writing a proof uh, using the elements of, of careful proof communication that we've been working on for this semester. I'm going to take one more break for about 15 or 20 seconds. We'll come back and do one last proof example uh, using the definition of centralizer of an element. So to wrap up our stream today, um, I want to get us some more practice using the, the definition and concept of center and centralizer. Um, and in particular, I want us to look at centralizer in this example because I want to tackle problem number 19 uh, from our list of preparation problems. Um, what this problem is asking us to do is to verify that the centralizer of an element, A, in a group, is the very same as the centralizer of the inverse of A. Um, so to succeed in this proof, we're really going to have to unpack um, what centralizer actually means. What is the definition of centralizer? So I sort of give you a, a hint as to how to unpack that uh, here in the, in the online problem set here. Um, this equality of sets uh, can be established by saying that any element of my group that commutes with A will also commute with the inverse of A x commutes with a if and only if it commutes with the inverse of a. Why is this? Because the definition of centralizer. So let's go back into the definition of centralizer real quick. Um, let g be a group and x be, uh, well, no, I guess we'll say, uh, let's say little g, be an element of g. 
the centralizer of the element g, centralizer of little g in the group big G, is usually denoted by capital C of little g. And sometimes, if the context is important, uh, we'll also put a little subscript of which group we're talking about um, next to the, the capital C here. Um, we won't do that uh, in this example because the context is pretty clear. Um, but the definition of this thing is it's the set of all elements of my group, g, that commute with little g. x times little g is equal to little g times x. So the centralizer is an answer to the question, what commutes with me? Uh, where the me in this example is the little g. Right? So all the elements of my centralizer are exactly those elements that commute with g. And so this proof is asking me to establish that every element of my group that commutes with a, so every element in this set, will also commute with a inverse. And vice versa, every element that commutes with a inverse will commute with a. So let's pull out a napkin and see if we can uh, see if we can talk ourselves into uh, why this result should be true. So, all right, so we've got one set, the centralizer of A. And I've got another set, the centralizer of A inverse. And since these two are sets, in order to justify the set equality, what we really need to do is establish two subset uh, uh, claims. Uh, so I need to show that the centralizer of A is a subset of the centralizer of the inverse, and then also vice versa. Um, so to establish the, the subset going this way, what I need to do is pick an element, an arbitrary element of the centralizer of A, and then show why that element is also an element of the centralizer of A inverse. All right, to do that, if x belongs to the centralizer of A, that means that it commutes with A xa is equal to ax. And so this is the thing that we'd like to assume if we're doing a direct proof, right? And the thing we'd like to deduce over here is that xa inverse is equal to a inverse x. All right, so we have our beginning, we have our end. Now we just need to figure out how to get there. All right, so how do we do that? Um, what is our, our path to turn the equation on the left into the equation on the right? Well, let's just play around with it. That's why we use napkins, right? Is that we can wad it up and throw it away if we don't like the work that we're doing. Um, but what if uh, we took this equation over here uh, and then maybe we just multiplied by a inverse on the left of each of these, right? So I'll have an a inverse on the left, an a inverse on the left, Again, being very careful here when we do this, that we can't do a mixed multiplication. If I choose the left multiplication on one side, I have to use left multiplication on the other side also. But the virtue of that, of course, is that I have now an a inverse times a that are going to go away. And so my right-hand side is just going to be x now. My left-hand side is a inverse x a. And now I'm almost where I need to be. The only thing in my way is this a that's on the right-hand side of this expression. So let's multiply by a inverse on the right of each of these. And now that's going to have the effect of canceling out this a with this a inverse. And I'm going to get a inverse x on the left-hand side and x a inverse on the right-hand side. And that's exactly what I wanted to get. All right. Um, so that gives me some reassurance um, that this is going to be, uh, seemingly at least, a true statement. Um, that at least gives me the argument going in this direction. Um, the argument in the other direction would be completely analogous. All we would have to do is we would have to reverse this string of steps uh, that we used to get from this, this one to that one. Right? Each one of these steps was actually reversible. Um, Another way to, to say that is if we just replace all of the a's with a inverses uh, in this whole logic, all the logic remains the same. So we wouldn't have to use a new process uh, to justify the subset going the other direction. So that's enough for me, at least, to justify that this is a true statement and begin writing up this proof. So let's do it. So we'll call this a proposition. Um, let g be a group and a be an element of that group. Then the centralizer 
of A agrees with the centralizer of A inverse, i.e. C of A equals C of A inverse. So there's the proposition that we're going to write our proof of. Sorry, let me get this onto a new page here. All right, so let's write up this proof using the work we have over on the napkin. All right, so how do we do that? <clears throat> so to establish the equality of two sets, the set equality will show that each, uh, each of C of A and C of A inverse are subsets of the other. And so that structures out uh, my two steps of my proof. C of A is a subset of C of A inverse. This is ex the, exactly the one that we prove on the napkin. And then the second is the other way around. C of A inverse is a subset of C of A. So remember, anytime you're proving an equality of two sets, uh, your burden of proof is to establish two claims, that each one of those sets is a subset of the other one. All right, and this first subset claim is the one that we proved exactly over here on the napkin. And so to prove that we have a subset, what we want to do is prove choose an arbitrary element in the set on the left. We wish then to show, here's the burden of proof, that x belongs to c of a inverse. So anytime you're trying to prove a subset relationship, um, what you need is you need an element argument. So prove an element to take, pick up an element of the set, uh, the, the subset, and then prove that it belongs to the superset. Right? Okay, and how did we do that? Uh, we did that by using the definition of centralizer. Right? X belongs to C of A. So by definition of centralizer, sorry, so there's the byline here. By definition of centralizer, um, x belongs to C of A means that xA is equal to ax. So there's the byline uh, that I put in to show how we're using the definition of centralizer to give me this equation, xA is equal to ax. Whoops, sorry, moving my window around by accident. OK, um, now going over to the napkin, we'll repeat our, uh, our argument from the napkin. But if xA is equal to ax, um, then what we did was we multiplied on the left by a inverse. a inverse xA is equal to x. And then we multiplied on the right uh, of that by, uh, by a inverse as well. Uh, so a inverse x is equal to xA inverse. So there were our three key steps uh, that were a part of our, uh, uh, our reasoning over on the napkin. And I can add in the bylines here. Left multiplying by A inverse gave me the first step. And the second step was right multiplying by A inverse. So now that's including my bylines here as part of my reasoning. And then, I've arrived, now that I've arrived on this last line, I've shown that x commutes with a inverse. Thus, by definition of centralizer, we have that x belongs to the centralizer of the inverse. And so, we've met the burden of proof for our first piece of the claim. Right? We've now shown that c of a is a subset of c of a inverse, because we picked an arbitrary element of c of a, and we've now proven that x, that arbitrary element belongs to C of A inverse. And we'll economize our argument um, here by saying that this second claim follows just by replacing A inverse uh, by A in the above. Um, so this claim holds by the above logic, replacing A by A inverse. And that concludes our proof. 
So this was not only a good opportunity for us specifically to think about centralizers, um, but it also is a great example of how to structure a proof where there's really not a whole lot of magical insight into why this result is true. There's just a careful unpacking of definitions um, and then one algebraic manipulation, the one that we did here, um, to show why uh, the equation that we began with as our part of our assumption uh, can be transformed into the deduction we were trying to make uh, at the end. If x uh, commutes with a, then x also commutes with a inverse. Uh, and then running that same logic backwards or by replacing a by a inverse, we can show that it goes the other way as well. So the centralizer of an element is always the same subgroup as the centralizer of the inverse of that element. So that's going to wrap up today's live stream. Um, streaming from home again works a lot better for me for some reason um, than streaming from the office. So this is all going to be one chunk YouTube video. I'm going to upload this uh, for your watching pleasure after the fact. Um, we will come back together uh, in our next class. Uh, we'll do a quiz and then we'll look ahead at the exam that happens at the end of the week. I look forward to seeing you then.